much wonderful Lorraine. What a great start of this evening. Very, very warm welcome to all of you. It's so nice to see you here tonight. I hope you are doing well and that you have got something to eat and that you are comfortable in your seats right now. So my name is Anna Sjöström Duarji, I'm the head of the Nobel Prize programs and for us working with the Nobel Prize, today is a special day. Martin Luther King, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964 and he is one of our most beloved Nobel Prize laureates. Today, he would have celebrated his 19th birthday, and what a better way to celebrate it than together with you. <laughs> the Nobel Prize is awarded for those who have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind within science, literature and peace, and thereby have contributed to a better world for all of us. The Nobel Peace Prize to Martin Luther King, Jr. was a clear statement from the Nobel Committee that peace does not only mean the absence of war in the sense of international conflicts. Instead, they defined it in a broader concept that includes defending human rights, dignity and freedom. Throughout the history of the Peace Prize, we have seen several of these champions not least in the last year's prize to Dr. Dennis Mukwege and Nadia Murad. In September... <laughs> and in September last year, a new exhibition opened at the Nobel Museum in Gamastan, The Right to Freedom, Martin Luther King Jr. And that is a way for us to celebrate his big achievements. For us working with the Nobel Prize, we often talk about how the prize award work has changed the world. And it's clear that the work of Dr. King did not only change the world at the time of his life, but also in the years and decades to come. And one of the persons who has carried this legacy of Dr. King further, perhaps even more than anyone else, is Reverend Jesse Jackson. He has not only carried forward the work that started by Martin Luther King, but he has also updated and revised it, keeping the struggle relevant for new generations and has also given them hope that changes can be achieved. So we thought, what could be more suitable then to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday, his 90th birthday, than to actually invite Reverend Jesse Jackson to Stockholm? and we are enormously proud and happy that he accepted the invitation. Before I have the great pleasure and honor to welcome him up here on stage, here is a presentation on both Martin Luther King Jr. and today's guest of honor, Jesse Jackson. the 20th century, the American South was a deeply segregated society. Schools, buses, restaurants, movie theaters, and public spaces were divided between whites and African Americans. African Americans were subjected to harassment and violence, including lynchings. Despite many obstacles, African Americans fought for better conditions and equal rights as citizens. In 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, civil rights activist Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man on a bus. She was arrested, and a boycott of buses began. The person designated to lead the campaign was a young pastor named Martin Luther King Jr. The bus boycott became the opening salvo for a movement that spread across the United States. King became a leading figure in the fight for freedom and justice. Through his I Have a Dream speech at the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the message spread across the world. In 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his nonviolent struggle for African American rights. A few months after receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, 
King was in Selma, Alabama, where he played a leading role in a campaign for equal voting rights for African Americans. There he met a young civil rights activist, Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, where he participated in protests against segregation in 1960 as a college student. King was impressed by Jackson's energy and organizational skills. Jackson was given an important role in the activities King and his organization wanted to carry out in Chicago. Operation Breadbasket, which Jackson led, promoted greater opportunities for African Americans in the labor market and strengthening African American businesses. Jesse Jackson was one of the colleagues accompanying Martin Luther King Jr. when King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. After King's death, Jackson continued King's unfinished project for economic justice, the Poor People's Campaign. During the 1970s, Jackson continued to promote African Americans' economic opportunities. He also became more deeply involved in politics, and in 1984 and 1988, he ran unsuccessfully to become the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. Jesse Jackson has also been active at the international level, including as a negotiator. He is still an active advocate for peace, freedom, and justice at the national and international levels. So, now I have to ask you for help, and help me in welcoming Reverend Jesse Jackson, who will come up here and have a conversation with one of the most well-renowned journalists in Sweden, Jenny Stormstedt. We are so happy to have both of them here tonight. Please welcome up. for a better world. Um, I'm, ner I'm nervous to sit here with you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't be. I'm the one shaking. Can, um, can, can you blow me another big hand? <laughs> accomplished so much during history and you are also a very wise man but one thing I wonder is how wise is it to come to Stockholm in January? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, before we went down here uh, we prayed together and you asked for uh, us tonight to be able to inspire people and to make the world a more secure place. Is that one of your missions today when you are out traveling the world? It is, and all of us have that capacity. If it were completely dark in this room, and someone lit one candle that would challenge all the darkness, light has that power. And each of us has that light. All of us cannot be famous because we cannot be well known. We can be great because we can serve. Our, our light is a source of service. So I pray to God that someone tonight will be inspired by uh, our dialogue to leave here and make an even greater commitment to, to peace in the world. You are, uh, you are at a respectable age, I should say, uh, and you are also living with the deceased Parkinson's. How that, and still you are coming here today, which I think is worth an applause. Uh, anyway. Before we start, how does Parkinson affect your, your, your life today? Well, Parkinson's is in trouble, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, the, the, the doctor diagnosed it some time ago, and it, uh, I didn't realize it was congenital. I did not grow up with my father. He had Parkinson's. And uh, it's kind of three dimensions. One is the, the routine of medicine uh, and the therapeutic exercises and faith. With those three, I think faith may be the strongest of the three. Because if you take your medicine on a regular basis and do the exercise, it'll be all right. And, and you have to remain active and work. And uh, I will not let any disease stand between me and my quest to do it and to share the gift God has given to me. Today, uh, as Anna said, is the 90th birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, do you miss him? I miss him very much. You know, uh, I was blessed to be with him on his last birthday. And I've seen people around the world attempt to celebrate the state. And uh, I think that, you know, how he spent his own birthday may be instructive for us. Uh, that morning he had uh, breakfast around 8 o'clock with his family and came to the church, you know, the basement of the church with the blue jeans on, a windbreaker jacket. And there were about 60 of us. Some whites from Appalachian, the poor region of, of, of the states, and some blacks and Latinos, Native Americans, some Jewish American allies from New York, and some leaders from labor on how to organize a poor people's campaign. Uh, and we were going to go from Mars, Mississippi, to Washington and challenge the, the priorities to end the killing in Vietnam and start healing at home. The money is designed for our healing, was going to kill it. We were prepared to go to Washington and if necessary go to jail, time traffic to force the Congress to, to react to us. Uh, around noontime, a, a friend of his, an only friend, brought in a cake, said, Doc, you forgot it was your birthday. We didn't realize it was his birthday at the time. And uh, then we had another session after the holiday in the war in Vietnam. We spent his own birthday there for with family at church organizing this ambitious vision he had. Because we have four, we have one public foundation, right to vote, but so many people trapped in poverty and trapped in war. And the poor were dying in war and dying at home from poverty. And that's how he spent his own birthday. And so, to me, every word is a chance for us to serve, do something meaningful, uh, and not just celebrate in some empty kind of way. Uh, in 1964, uh, Dr. King receives the Nobel Prize for Peace, and uh, this is at the moment in time when, and now I'm going to quote Dr. King from his Nobel speech, 22 million Negroes of the United States are engaged in a creative battle to end the long night of racial injustice. What did the Peace Prize mean to the civil rights mo uh, movement at the time? So much of our struggle was that people were marginalized and denied fair access to the media. After all, he was not an elected official, not seen as an authority, but kind of modernized as a Southern preacher, even though he had a PhD, he was a very learned man. Uh, the, the Nobel Prize gave him a renewed stature, gave him global platform. Put the, it's like the whole world is watching. And he used that to catapult him to a place where he could speak was moral authority about the end of the war in Vietnam. And he speak about poverty at home and our government. Uh, so it was an empowering award uh, for him. Uh, he used it to uh, shed light in dark places. And we were, we were so grateful for the people of this country who made it possible. But he used it to the maximum because what he was focused on poverty, a war of violence, and he said, I have the right to speak, I have an obligation to speak, and I will speak, and I will be heard. The government attacked him viciously. Uh, the, the Democratic Party attacked him. The FBI attacked him. Uh, and yet he said, I, I, I'm a Nobel Prize laureate, and I will speak, and I will be heard. But can you think it's kind of sad to need the sort of white endorsement to, to be heard? Well, because the same forces that controlled our life situation controlled the press. They were, they were publishers, and they were writers, and they didn't publish, they didn't write. You didn't have a platform. 
And I remember uh, on one occasion with Dr. King, I, I had him to go to Greenville, South Carolina, my hometown, to do a, uh, we were working a bakery. They would not pay black people after the wages. Like 4,000 people showed up at the rally. There was not one line in the paper. So it was saying, it was, it was a way of saying he didn't exist, he didn't count. But, but that was other wars, we could no longer be pushed to the margins. So Johnson had a point of view as president, Dr. King had a point of view as Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize laureate. And uh, it, 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 uh, it, it gave us a, a beacon light of hope. And that's what was indebted to those who made that possible. Mm -hmm. He said in his speech that, uh, talked about the battle to end the long night of racial injustice. Uh, if you move 54 years forward up to today, where are, is, are we still in the night of racial injustice? We're in the night and we're still seeking for rays of light. This is the 400th year of African American soldier in the United States, 400 years from 1619. For 244 years, we were in slavery. Uh, that's not just like a word in slavery. No right to marry. No right to give your children your name. No right to an education. No right to a job with wages. Uh, and any, no right for a woman to, 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 to declare rape. Uh, our people were raped into a, a new people. But since you're a non-person, you can't even cry rape. So women were violated, and men were killed. They could not sue because they were property. And that lasted, say, 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. We had been in slavery 157 years when that occurred. And then in 1789, when the, Declaration, when the uh, Constitution was written, they determined, since we were the, the source of power behind the cotton industry, which was the driving force at that, at that time, uh, we were considered three-fifths of a human being. We had to be cataloged in, in some way. And we continued to 19, 1862, and the war had begun. The South sought to secede from the country and engage in sedition, secession, slavery, and segregation. And that was a civil war. And Lincoln said in 100 days, if you do not, if you do not re return to the Union, I will free them. What's significant about that is that uh, the South itself, a new government, had their own government, their own um, uh, uh, currency, uh, their own military, their, 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 their own militia, their, their own government, their own constitution. And, um, and the backbone of their movement was Africans who were the Line, the supply line for the military, performance for their food and the industrial base for their economy as they connected with Britain and France to form this new, new country. And when Lincoln made the decision to free us on that day, two things happened. One, the South had gotten as far north as Maryland and as far north as Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. freed Lincoln. Because in the real sense, if, if the South had won, we would not be celebrating July the 4th as Declaration of Independence. We would not be celebrating the Constitution. And the, new, the, 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 the Constitution would have been Confederate, and the new day would have been the Fort Sumter shot from South Carolina. So that, in some sense, there's a high degree of mutuality. Uh, African Americans were freed from slavery and the country, the Union was spared. And then, um, but Lincoln was killed. And when Lincoln was killed, it's so significant this piece of history now because 
when he was killed, his successor was a, a Trump-type reactionary who, in fact, determined to ally with the, with the slave masters. And so what's called the Till and Hayes Compromise really was a betrayal for we had saved the Union and we ended slavery. The result is that Jim Crow was more harsh than slavery. In slavery, at least we were property that was considered an asset. When we were free, we became a threat because we could vote. To stop us from voting, 5,000 blacks were lynched in 1880, 1950, and mob violence to deter us from voting. And so by 1954, the law changed again. Dr. King emerges out of that struggle. Mrs. Uh, Parks, apart from being this kind of a caricature, humble lady, she was a freedom fighter. And she was testing the 54 decision. And in testing it, she was arrested. But he was a young minister in town, very prepared to fight, to fight, to fight. And he emerged out of that struggle with a tactic mass action and nonviolence. And for 13 years, he was able to, to redefine the nature of our struggle in relation between blacks and white in America. And we see evidence of his work today. I mean, he, the seeds he planted are still blossoming. How aware, when, when growing up in Greenville as a, a child, how aware were you of the history of slavery? I'm sorry. How, when, when growing up in Greenville, how aware were you of the history of the African American people? Well, you know, I, I'm 77. My father would have been uh, 101. My father's mother was in slavery. Mm -hmm. Slavery is just three to four generations deep for my, for my families. We lived in the raw racial segregation. Uh, the day he gave the speech in Washington, uh, it's called the Dream Speech, but the context of it is important. The day he gave that speech from Maryland, well, from Texas to Florida to Maryland, we couldn't use a single public toilet in the state capitol. The day he gave that speech, we could not drink water with a single public fountain we could not buy ice cream with Howard Johnson's or rent a room at Holiday Inn the day he gave that speech. Black and Latino soldiers that sit behind Nazi prisons of war on American military bases. So the context, it was a heavy, the dream was heavy labor, it was not just a little where the climax it was, it was hard labor. And the people were weeping because we were determined to break that system down. And of course, that's what happened. I grew up in the, I, one of the most my humiliating experiences with my mother was I got on the bus and was going downtown with her one day. And, and I used to sit behind my grandfather driving the wood truck. Mm -hmm. And I sat behind the driver as I did at home. And he said, until I have some auto on this bus, I'm not moving. I, I think you saw my meeting with three white kids, but they were playing, but they were innocent playing. Uh, and he said loud enough for the adults in the back to hear him. My mother came again, she pinched me. My mother, why are you pinching me? And I was humiliated. And so one of my father's friends said, she's pinching you because she loves you. I didn't understand that. And, um, and the other one sitting next to you, don't you sit next to them. If the bus has a wreck, those in the back won't get hurt. He was building around me a, uh, a, a cushion from the pain and the rejection. The above the driver's head was a sign that said, go to see the real whites from the front. If he had violated that, he could have been arrested himself. It was a system of legal segregation. And so, and so I was born at home. We didn't have a hospital for the colored. Uh, we went to school uh, with double shifts. Black teachers made a lesson, white teachers by the law. So yeah, I grew up in the throes of real legal segregation. Do you remember how old you were when you realized the magnitude of uh, segregation and racism in society? I saw it before I realized its magnitude. For example, uh, the, the, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation is more dynamic than the 13th Amendment. 
in that in that Lincoln says all those who have been in prison will be set free. And it was full wisdom of the federal government and the military behind it. So it was a very broad executive order. But the, the North was reluctant to let us join them to help them. The idea of it, because there was a lot of sleep in the North as well. And so the Fifth Amendment says all of this is free except those who have been in prison. So the South used the imprisoned part, opened up a whole uh, contract labor system where people who are unemployed were actually arrested. And they worked for free on farms and took back and sleep again. The leaders of the slave system became leaders of the segregation, segregation system. And so men would be on our neighbors, our neighbors would, uh, would be unemployed, and they, the police would come through on the weekend and take them and take them to the stockade. And if they were, uh, if their boss didn't come to get them, they'd be back in the neighborhood raking the leaves and cleaning out gutters on the weekend. Some was humiliating about that. But a mother had to say to her son, you want to ask the boss who had the shotgun on the dog, can I give your dad a cigarette, can I give your dad a sandwich? I began to feel the, see the system. When I went to the, on the bus, I began to feel the evidence of it. And I think the most telling part to me was, mom would say, next year you're going to school, you better learn, babe, you're going to school, you're going to school. About a mile from where we lived was a nice, beautiful brick schoolhouse. The tulips and they had the, the, the swings and the, the, the merry-go-round, all that. And we went to church about three miles across town, and there none of those facilities there. So I looked forward to going to school to that place. The day I came downstairs with my mother down to the yard, and I was going toward the school, and she pulled my hand and sent me toward the school that was across town, across the railroad track. And I had to go to the segregated school. I had to make a choice. And there was not a choice. I had, to, I had to go to that school. So I began to feel the, the limitations segregation. We had to make a one vote for six of us. Our teachers made less money by the law than the white teachers. So the system was programmed to keep us marginalized. But somehow we were taught that there's something within us that said that we could overcome. Yeah, well, some of us said we ought to. So that, that was the burning desire implanted in us by our teachers that, that, that you can overcome. Some of them says you, you have non-negotiable dignity. And, and that you, was you your know, teacher that told you that. Indeed. Because you said that time is neutral and does not change things, but with <coughs> courage and initiative, leaders change things. And then I wonder, from this kid in the segregated school system, you became a leader. Why? I do not know the extent to which personality is a factor. Leadership or uh, certain experiences. I went to college and uh, I could not go to the colleges closest to us. They were all white, Clemson University, for example. And um, even for Christmas, I had to use them. Uh, I'd do a speech of 25, I could take the bibliographies. I ran to the color library and they didn't have that many books. Miss Mr. Mr. Well, I will get you permission to use the general library, the white library, if you would go quickly. So she wrote me a note that she called the library and said I was Because you weren't there. allowed to go there, to the no, public library. So I went to the back door and she said, she said two police just happened to be standing there with her. I was not even up to think that they didn't look so at home. And so she said, I'll get the books for you in seven days. I need the books now. I have to read these books and, and write and memorize the speech. She said, I said, Matt, I said, Matt, Matt, but I'm in sacks. We just here alone. He said, you heard what she said. I got the message. I went to the back of the library and I cried. My father just come home from World War II. And he was uh, embittered by freedom to fall for in Germany and didn't have a home. That summer, seven of my classmates and I, we, we were arrested trying to use that library. It soon open up, and so I lost the fear of jails and death at that time. 
and found in jails for the righteous cause, dignity. So I've been on, on, on a struggle for dignity and fighting that system the rest of my life. But uh, after that action that you took, um, a, a lawyer filed suits on your behalf, and uh, two months later the library system abandons formal segregation. What did that victory tell you? That we, that, that we could win. The system seemed so overwhelming. But it was clear if, if, we, if, we, if we developed a strategy and targeted our we, 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 could, we could win, and pretty soon we, uh, we won the public accommodations bill. Now that is a very significant piece of legislation uh, because to be taught, the whites to be taught that they are racially and patriarchally supreme, and blacks to be taught the inferior women to be marginalized, uh, for that to become illegal gave us a renewed sense of something. During that season, it's, it's interesting that UNESCO had a, a, a paper, uh, United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organization, that said blacks were not inferior. It was a big deal to us. We, we, we were from the pulpits. They said in the world, we're not inferior. We're not inferior. We're not inferior. We're really not inferior. But isn't that also a strange situation? Some meaning you're not inferior and then thinking, uh, well, no, we're not. Stupid, you know. Uh, well, we, we had some uh, some outside uh, uh, validation of, of our humanity. Uh, we we felt that way uh, in a thousand ways. We felt we were, we were human, but so many other things that you're not human. You're not human enough to ride the front of the bus. Not human enough to uh, uh, drive a bus. Not human enough to work at the bank. They're human enough to go to the university. And so while you might say that you, you're human, the, the forces of the system say that you are not. And, and part of Dr. King's genius was to convince us that we were. Uh, Dr. King. Do you remember first meeting him? I do. And, and I say that we first, Dr. King finished high school at 15. He finished college at 19. You get a seminary degree at 22, and a PhD at 26. He's a very learned man. And had the capacity to express himself in ways, the great source of inspiration to us. Uh, strange enough, uh, when, I, when I was in college, going to Morehouse, to school to speak, come to I met him on his way to Sweden to get his Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> it was a big deal for me. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I had been to jail in Greensboro, North Carolina, trying to use a, a, a public facility. And he called my name. Because he was very aware of the movements around the South. He asked me how was my seminar, how was my college president doing, who was his classmate. And we, we kind of connected at that moment. It was just such a beautiful, he was on his way here to get the prize. Boy, that was a big, big moment. And uh, two years later, we were in Selma, and he called for us to come after the Sunday. I met him, I saw work of him. At that time, I worked with him until, until he was killed in Memphis. You were there in so many defining moments, as you said, in Selma, for example, and also in the March in Washington. What, what do you remember from this time? Were you, I mean, this is history. This is something that changed the path of history. Did you, did you feel that when you were there at the present moment? Our work was so international, and yet we felt so local <coughs> in, in some sense. Uh, I remember while, while he was excited, January 15, 1968, and we were on our way, you know, we were one of victors by that. April, he was depressed. Uh, he called one Friday night and said at around 10 o'clock, so I want you guys to meet me where I'm in my office at 10 o'clock. It was Friday night. We had things to do. I was in Chicago at the time. So Reverend Abernathy called and said, Martin, it's serious. You need to be here. He said, I'll, I'll be there, Doc. I really didn't want to go. Because we had a bread basket meeting the, the, the next morning. So I got there, I put it at 7 o'clock, I called Reverend, I said, I, I, I can't make it. 
miss our plane. He said, I know you're going to miss it. I have a 725 plane. So we caught the plane. And he came in the room that morning, the very solemn way. He said, you know, um, for three days I've been with my wife, Coretta, and and then his wife, Jean, and Ralph, and his wife, um, and uh, Juanita. And uh, I've been depressed. I said, maybe I've done as much as I can do in 13 years. Maybe I should just quit. And the man Young said, Doc, don't talk that way, Sandy. Don't, don't say peace, peace. And there is no peace. Let me, let me finish talking. I kind of quote from the book of Jeremiah. And he said, but I, I can't quit because if I were to turn around, people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tucker, those who never quit would, would, would not accept me, so I can't quit. But I, I've been down. He said, then I thought that many of our fellow leaders are uh, arguing now about tactics, whether they should be violent or non-violent or not. He said, maybe I thought maybe if I would fast to the point of death, we would come to my bedside and we could re regroup and, 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 and re re rebuild our unity. And then he said, you know, we went on to Washington because uh, we are work to and nothing is it's like he he talked himself out of the depression. And I was taking copious notes because it's like the same three moves that Jesus went through, that uh, Jesus was at the point nearing death. Uh, let this cup pass from me. Maybe, maybe I should quit, he was saying. And as he prayed, disciples slept. Then not my will but thine be done. The same three moves. Uh, and we've left that and went on to Memphis. And of course, we talk about Memphis a little bit, that, that, that dynamic changed that because once we got to Memphis, that was attempted by the government to undercut our struggle. The, uh, the, the, the riot that took place the week before we were marching was some boys being paid to throw rocks to distract from our struggle. Uh, but nonetheless, he spent much of that day, April the 3rd, talking about his highest father made his mother. And going through his family tree. And um, that night, around 4 o'clock, he said, I don't feel like speaking. Just you speak tonight. I said, Doc, I don't have it. I've got anything. And he looked at Ralph. And so we said, Ralph, so just let him go together. Went to, went, went to, went to the church. And uh, it, a couple of thousand people there. And they cheered. Wildly. The rabbi suggested they're not cheering for us, they think Mom is behind us, that's not us to cheer. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the back of the church and, and called him on the phone. Pay phone to my friends and said, ah. <laughs> And um, I said, Mom, you must come, but just for 15 minutes. This need to see this. They're, they're coming in the rain to see you. He said, I'll be there. He came, and Reverend Abner gave him a rather long introduction so he could kind of get himself together. And that's when he, he kind of walked through. If I had a time I could be alive, it would be now. He walked it. And then I've been to the mountaintop. And I may not get there. We had no, it, it, was, it was so dramatic. Uh, we had no sense that uh, he felt what he felt, the, the sense of that moment for him. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't know he was being set up to be killed. We didn't know. Leaders often internalize a lot of pain, a lot of anxiety that the other rest of us wouldn't know about. But it was so dramatic until it's, I may not get there. I saw men crying, was on, on, not an ordinary experience. It was, and then he went to another level of his or, oration. And but um, we'll, we'll get to the promised land. Now we've seen the evidence of the promised land. It was fleeting since that time. Uh, and that's why that moment stands out in my mind because he didn't, he didn't intend to go. Uh, and without a note in his hand, he just took us to another level of obligation, really, in consciousness. Do you keep that in your heart? Yes, because we could not let one bullet kill our struggle. Most of us did not go back to Memphis for the trial. We said what killed Dr. King was not just a guy, but a sick society. He was killed, the FBI leaders in Atlanta 
leap for joy on the tables. Uh, they were upset because when Smyrna couldn't have chained it, two Jews and a black had been killed. Dr. King uh, said that they were not searching vigorously for the killers. And Hoover called Dr. King a down liar and said if 100 men were arrested in a state of emergency, Dr. King would be one of them. Well, Dr. King, with this rare sense of courage, was fearless in the face of that. Uh, we were not, and he said, don't be afraid because there's no defense against ambush and sabotage. When you die now, tomorrow you will die. Make your living matter and, and make sure the living is not in vain. So we had that, that sense of courage that came from him, really. Because Dr. King was killed, uh, many other people were also killed in the struggle. Did you, during this time, ever think that we, we should have had another strategy? Or, or what did you do with your rage? It was the right strategy. Uh, we knew full well that if you, if you battled against the occupiers, as in the case of Jesus, which is our model, uh, Job said, though you slay me again, will I trust you? With the, with the people not about to give up on, on our sense of religion and our sense of mission. <coughs> he said, um, the crucifixion took place in Memphis, but the resurrection does not take place far beyond the crucifixion site. And so we knew that we'd face jails and we could be killed and we could be jailed, but we would not let, we would turn the, we'd let the blood become a source of transformation. If we would, if we had stopped then, we would let him down. So we say it's not who killed him, it's what killed him in civil society. We went on to Washington, the Fort Bush campaign said, end the war and feed the hungry, end the war and feed the hungry. And we thought that, that that was a big deal to him. What I found when I got to Washington, because we had this tent city uh, before we become multiracial, and um, one morning, on the back of the truck, I was mayor of a little makeshift city, protest town. Um, they were looking at me to give them some help. People were down. But the King of Egypt, like before, Robert Kennedy was killed June the 5th. It was raining. Uh, a couple people died in the camp of hepatitis. And we were really, I had no money to give them, no, no ticket home. And they were looking at me to say something, do something, be something. And I read a book by Dr. Howard Thurman, you know, Jesus said, the disinherited. And he said, when your back is against the wall, you stand naked against the world, you reduce your irreducible essence, you're still somebody, you're still matter, you're still God's child, that as long as there's life, there's hope, and there's hope, there's possibility. The justification for, picking, for, not, for looking down on someone is to pick them up. That was kind of in that book. And so I said, I am somebody. And people began to respond. I am somebody. I may be poor, I may be under, but I am somebody. It came out of that, out of that moment in time. And really, across the nearly 50 years now, where we use the, uh, the refrain, I am somebody. That is a very famous line. <laughs> well, that's where it came from. It came out of the situation. And the people, I may be unemployed, I may be, I may be unskilled, but I'm somebody. I'm going, I deserve education. I deserve health care. I deserve peace. And respect me, protect me, never neglect me. I am somebody. <laughs> if my mind can conceive my heart, believe I can achieve it, I am somebody. And then later on, when we were in the campaign and people wanted to give up, we said, keep hope alive. So keep hope alive, and I both came out of our sense of struggle to sustain our, our will to fight back because. In the struggle, people can, in time, lose their will to fight and surrender. Mm -hmm. You can't surrender and win. You have to keep fighting. Let's move into present time for a while and talk about the continuous struggle against segregation, against racism, for everyone's uh, equal value. And you uh, always pointed out that uh, and now I quote you, the disparity between rich and poor, who goes to college and who goes to jail, who lives long and who dies prematurely, is a defining issue of our time. And there's a significant race dimension and it's basically class-driven. 
So where do you start? With the economy or with the defeating racism? Or is it just something you have to deal with both at the same time? Well, at the same time, you know that um, it's, it's amazing now, essentially, that, that rugby and soccer and football and the, the, the listen to Lorene saying artists have a power in their gifts that even churches often don't occupy that space. Because when artists sing, there's something about music, something about it. when she sings uh, the songs in heaven dance, there's something about the music that, that takes us beyond our limited predicaments, makes us feel better about ourselves, and lifts us up. And, and why are we so good on the football, or let's say, on this side, of the, on soccer? You got the kid from the Gambia playing for Germany. A kid from Zimbabwe playing from England. Why are we so good at athletics? Whenever the playing field is even, and the rules are public, the goals are clear, the referee is fair, the score is transparent, we can make it. So, for, so that, that hour or two hours in time, we see the big rugby match or the big football in, in, in America or soccer in, in Europe. Even playing, now, we do not have that set of rules beyond the playing field. And that becomes our chance. It's a thing we're free but not equal. We don't have equal access. Can you be free uh, without being equal? Uh, ultimately, ultimately you, you, you cannot be free without being equal because uh, you have to get free to get equal. And when we came out of slavery, we were set free without reconstruction, free to starve, free to be illiterate, free to be unable to compete. And so the struggle for freedom to equality is different than the struggle to get to, to, to get to get free. Uh, effort and excellence means an awful lot in hard work. Effort and excellence and hard work. Inheritance and access means more. Those who inherit and those who have access have advantages that they shall fail to keep. And uh, part of what's happening now is as people who were on occupation or in slavery to the south of us in Africa and, and Asia and Latin America, they're now going to countries that rate them of their resources. They're going over the grass is green, we call it the immigration crisis. Either, we, either we're going to lift them up where they are, or they're, they're going to come over the resources are. Learn, so we've survived the part, we must now learn to live together. And that means for some people, they must unlearn some bad lessons learned well. Whites who feel superior must unlearn that. That's a bad lesson, a bad practice to learn, but they must unlearn that lesson. We must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or die apart as fools. How do you change that legacy? If we talk about the white privilege, because it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, un unconsciously enjoyed sometimes, and it's uh, sort of consciously perpetuated, and it's like legacy and the cause of, of racism. How do you change the legacy? How do you stop this? You must at least make racism Ill illegal. It's already moral. Racism is Race is not a race. Is, this, race distinguishes us. Racism oppresses us. Racism is the belief that one group is superior and should have the first and best of all things and build it to what they have, laws of inheritance. Uh, racism uh, politically is exploitative and divisive. Economically, it, it's a violation. It's a sin. We assume that God gave one group superior, another group inferior. So it, it is ungodly. So racism is a very sick disease. And it's not just the burden of the victim of racism to deal with racism, but those who have the disease must deal with it themselves. Those who look in the mirror and think themselves to be inferior are basically sick. They need healing, they, they need to get well. Now many people live, live with that sickness. and, and uh, but I, I, in my life and time, I've seen progress. Uh, when I was in South Africa in 1979, Black Ranger, South Carolina, all of the uh, 
flight attendants were white, all the pilots were white, all the pound workers were white. Now they're black and white. Uh, blacks that walk on one side of the street, whites on the other black the untouchables in, in India. Uh, there were no blacks in the legislature. And the see blacks and whites function together trying to rebuild the country. That had been in our life and time. Uh, but but um, to get rid of privilege, uh, I mean, generally, someone has to step down from privilege, and that is not something that people do voluntarily most of the time. So that is part of what we see maybe happening today, both in Europe and in the United States. So but, but sharing privilege is that, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a zero-sum game. Okay. Uh, you have to be diminished for me to be assertive. Uh, when, when you walk on, on, on the rugby, the football field, uh, you simply have to compete on the uh, even, even playing field. And uh, as, I, as I watch these games from now, you see black players and white cheerleaders and vice versa embracing. They learn to live together. And that's racism to learn behavior. And anti-racism to learn behavior. Uh, I, I've seen blacks go to a given school that was all white. And it's, can, can you cope with that society? Okay, those who run such, can they cope with it? In, in the real world, I'll put this another way, Jenny. Half all human beings are Asian, half of them are Chinese. One eighth African, one fourth Nigerian. Uh, there are more people in India than in the US and Russia combined. In North America, two thirds of our neighbors speak Spanish. English, English is a minority language in, in America. So the burden of, of the white privilege learning to live, live with the world is important. Most folks in the world today, tonight, are yellow, brown, black, non-Christian, poor, female, young, and don't speak English. We have an obligation to learn how to live with people of the world. We cannot survive in isolation. None of us can survive in isolation. But we're living in a time where confrontation and uh, uh, is all, I mean, it's almost commercial in a way. Um, and it's also we're struggling with extremists on, on both sides. So how, I mean, this is the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winning question, how do we learn to live together? <laughs> <laughs> you get the prize if you ask for it. <laughs> Those leaders who share their light and give courage, get rewarded. Oftentimes, they may be known at the local level. What deprives us, frankly, is to, is to encourage light. It, it, it rewards light. The, the, the light, those who, who share the light, may do so with the loss of life. Manila met 27 years in jail. Dr. King had been dead at 39. So the, often those who have the light pay a big price for the light. But, but it's a way, the Nobel Prize is a way of saying uh, somebody recognizes that service matters and suffering and sacrifice matters. And if you serve, if you're a servant leader, uh, you, you, you'll be rewarded somehow on earth, not just in the hereafter. Uh, I, I think that when I look at this, it's, uh, I was here a few years ago, a guy named Diallo, a guy in the parliament here, he was being called monkey and nigger and names. He's now serving the parliament in Sweden. The society is making room for him. And so we're having, we're having, to, uh, we're having to adjust to learning to live together. Uh, and I, I see the adjustment taking place. And I, and I look up and see black parliamentarians in Rome and in Sweden uh, and in Paris and Britain, an African American president of the United States of America. We are better now than we were 50 years ago. We have a ways to go, but we are, we are better off today than we were 50 years ago. In part because of communications, uh, there, there are no more foreigners in this world. If you go on a plane in New York, go on the LA, and I'm going to Santa Claus, we get there about the same time. Your size will go up there same time. We can sit on the stage tonight and be looking at South Africa and China, Australia and New York at the same time. That size properly used to make us better off. You could be doing surgery in Stockholm 
and teaching surgery and South Carolina at the same time. So science properly used can make us a better people in the world today. Uh, looking at America, how has the Trump administration affected the struggle for equality and anti-racism? It could be discouraging. <laughs> it, is, it has inspired us to fight back. You, 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 either, you either have a broken spirit or you have an inspired spirit. I think that, and first of all, it's the tough things that, that encouraged me. One, he lost by three million votes in, 19, in 2016. He lost. And using a uh, slavery definition of, 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 of uh, electoral college, He's the, the, he, he's the, he, the, the loser, loser won. In 2018, in the midterms, he lost by nine million votes. We regained the Congress so that we are fighting back. Women are fighting back. Uh, he won in some measure in, 19, in 2016 because 6% of the white women voted for Trump against Hillary. That's strange. Uh, and yet, those women realized that the, his very first act was to attack Planned Parenthood and women's right to self-determination. So that's a certain wake up among the women now. And, and the, the uh, we got the right vote in 1965. Blacks couldn't vote, but women can serve on jurors. 18 years couldn't vote, couldn't vote on campus, couldn't vote by language. That's the majority. When that coalition uh, matures, it has the power to take Barack and make him president. And, and, and so we see that coalition now coming alive because uh, Trump is counterculture to America's values. He tried to, the, the notion that Barack Obama is not an American. That didn't work with those who never support integration. Um, so in him, the champion, uh, the anti immigrant spirit. You can't, you can't have this your narrative. You give me your child, you put your whole master, you're in the very free, and then lock the folk out the gate. You can't say I'm a Christian, uh, Jesus born in an occupation, and himself born uh, uh, on, a, on a death warrant, who goes to Egypt as an immigrant and says as a refugee, Jesus was a boy of the baby. You can't follow that, Jesus. And then a lot of people are in cages along the borders, and, 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 and so we're fighting back. And that, and but still, there are gaps in the American society right now. And you talk about learning people how to live together. Is this an irreversible gap? You think? No, because some some of our victories are not cannot be taken back because people have come unto themselves. Uh, Public accommodations, there's a white and black can sit together in a common audience. That, that's irreversible. It's not like going back. So when Clemson plays Alabama in a big football game, you see people judged by uniform color, not skin color, by direction, not by complexion. That part's not going back. Uh, when you're at the Olympics, if the Olympics were well, all white, America couldn't compete. <laughs> so, and it, 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 it was just all men and not women. We couldn't compete. And so you see, and in some sense we're going forward because women have changed their minds about themselves. And people of color change their minds. We're not going back. We, we see the art of nonviolence. I would, I would make the case that in the 1960s, our, our strength was courage and marching feet. And that's the vote. We now can vote, and no matter how much they maneuver, we are not giving up that vote. We, we, will, we, 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 we will survive Trump. Uh, Trump will go down in history as a, as a very, uh, as, a, as a federal president. We will survive him. He is locking people out the government. The government's have closed down today. We, we will outlast Trump. He, he, he challenges me, he inspires me to fight back. <laughs> Trump needs to be defeated, but 
you need them to get people to vote. And how do you get young people to engage in democracy, to, uh, to register, to go to vote uh, when there are computer games, even? I think this is a question that concerns more countries than the United States. Well, we saw more young participation in the last election. In America, if you're 18 years old, be 18 by the next election, you have the right to vote. Which means all college campuses are fully registered, eligible to register to vote. It should be automatic with registration, but it's not at this point. Ten states are automatic with registration. Before the, before the movie, it does not. So that's a piece of it. I think that my inspiration to me is to hold up people putting matters to them. People don't vote for abstract. Uh, student loan debt for uh, a mid student may be $200,000. So if, if, you, if, you, if you're voting for eliminating student loan debt, that's inspiration. You're voting for affordable education, affordable health care, that's inspiration. You're voting for security for seniors and gender equality for women. Uh, if, if, if you raise the bar, of hope high enough, with substance attached to the hope, people can be turned on. That's been my experience. So who will be the person to lead the Democratic Party for 2020, you think? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Are you interested a third time? Will well, that be the third time around? No. Colin Harry. No, no, no. Well, uh, let me say this, that uh, there are a number of very qualified people who've been inspired as to what's possible. One of the advantages of my running, I think, was to inspire people as to what was possible. I was talking with President Barack one day, we were downtown meeting. He said, uh, I didn't think that your running <coughs> could happen. And it didn't make sense to me, he said. And I was at the debate at, at Columbia University. And um, so you debate Monday in the heart. And I said to myself, this thing can happen. If in our work, if we plant seeds to the young people, this thing, this dream can happen. That, that's the best part of my work. This thing can happen. Uh, young people now are voting in ways they've not voted before uh, because this thing must happen. Because if they, if they don't vote, student loan debt will get higher. Uh, credit cards and substitute money will become more ominous. And so voting is, is, is a way of fighting back. And I think for a while that those who thought that they could use uh, uh, e emails and tweets the way of fight, tweets the way of fighting. You have to fight back with your heart, your soul, and your, and your, and your, and your courage. Yeah, you. Uh Two times you were part of the presidential uh, nomination, the primaries, and you came in third in 1984. What, what did that experience do with you? Well, I suppose two things it did. One, um, allowed me to employ the skills I learned as an organizer. And uh, in 84, we were sitting down one day and American policy crash in Syria. Now, I had met Assad before trying to get a two state solution for the Middle East, it is really Palestinian relationships. At the time, we had no talk policy. And so I called the ambassador who called Assad. Did I come and attempt to appeal to him to release the Robert Goodman? He released it. Reagan said to me, Don't go. You don't know, you're not an ambassador. You don't know what you're doing. And I got there, and I got good to release. They said, what did you do the Reagan didn't do? I said, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we brought him back to uh, the airport. And for the, for the person who asked me some challenging question about foreign policy, said, who paid the hotel bill? It was quite simple about it. I went to the White House. Who did pay? <laughs> the organization paid. And the people paid because they cared. We got to the White House. President Reagan convened his whole cabinet. 
Illinois was a, a, a naval power. It was a big deal for Americans. So he said, what can I do to help you? I said, call him aside and say thank you. <laughs> no, no, that was a big challenge for him. <laughs> call him aside, said thank you. They never stopped talking. Because he risked me that, 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 that the courage to communicate may be the key to the kingdom. And then after that, we went to, we brought Americans home from jail in Cuba and in Iraq, in Yugoslavia, in the Gambia, in Colombia, about 10 places around the world. We brought Americans home from prisons. But that they got my own sense of it. it. Nothing is too hard if you have the courage and, and, and the will to fight back. What was the key skill you had to be able to re uh, free those soldiers. Courage and the world view. If you see the world through a keyhole, you can't do it. You see the world through a door. I believe what, what, what links us together tonight, our languages are different, our message is the same. People in the, when David, when I was flying over here on SAS the other day, babies were not crying in Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> So what did they, they say? People are not laughing. They, well, the, the thing that makes us fundamentally human, whether it's crying or laughing, the, the thing that the, the, the connect human family, we all need love. We almost resolve conflict through our minds, not through missiles. We all need security. We all need, we, we need hope. We need joy. We all feel pain. Find, find out what connects us. So when I go to a given foreign country, Four things I found, whether it's Syria, or Iraq, or maybe Saddam Hussein, or any of them, was that first of all, they want recognition. <coughs> Two, uh, the countries were impoverished. Three, they want to be recognized by America as making a contribution. Four, we wish for the power of the religious leadership in those countries. And fifth, to release a person from prison to open the door for communications. And that was the, the common thread I found in all those situations where we got people out of jail. Uh, and I believe it can happen today. I think it's too much, uh, too much threats, too much military today. Uh, we, we, uh, we simply invest too much in killing, not enough in healing. We must make a choice to heal rather than kill. famous quotes, it's, uh, if you fall behind, run faster, never give up, never surrender, and rise up against the odds. Is this the story of your life? Right. In some sense it is. Um, an athlete, if you're behind, a little range playing to the coach, coach, we're behind. <laughs> Go. Uh, if you're behind, run faster. The world may be more determined. Make choices. Life is full of choices and consequences. Love is stronger than hate. You must believe that and act it out. Uh, courage is more so than cowardice. You must believe that. And, and love is contagious. Hope is contagious. Healing is contagious. Uh, and so those values inspire me to keep loving, keep trying. And I have found enough evidence victory. Now, now, now look back over the last 50 years, the progress we made in America and in the world. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't take for granted Nancy Pelosi being the head of the House of Representatives. Because the woman couldn't have been there 50 years ago. I don't take for granted Barack being president. You know, when Donald King was killed in April on the back of Memphis, Barack on the back of the White House, that's 40 years of the wilderness we got. For the issue of wilderness. To go from the balcony in Memphis, back and forth, I said, 40 years in America. He says, all things are possible if you don't if you if you if you believe. Well, and uh, I know Stevie Wonder, he wrote this happy birthday song to honor Martin Luther King, right? 
I'm not going to ask you to sing, although I know you're very nice singing. <laughs> no, but the story behind that is that when uh, Dr. King was killed and John Kennedy said we should have a King holiday, it was dismissed as this is unreal. Dr. King was the most hated man in America. He was very hated. The month before he was killed, 52% of the blacks saw him in the negative. They shouldn't be dealing with the war, should be dealing with Southern home. 72% of the whites had a negative views of Dr. King. And so he was, when he was killed, he became a, a, a dead martyr rather than a living human being. And uh, we would go out every year, maybe 15 years out on January 15th, uh, on the Lincoln, Mon on, on Lincoln Memorial, and say it should be a King holiday, and it just didn't happen. At some point, Stephen Wonder, who knew John Congress, the song Happy Birthday Martin Luther King, and that, that song captured the culture. Music at its best, artists at their best, have that power. And when, and when it became a, 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 a cultural phenomenon, there's a bunch of all people rigging signs in the, at the, into, a, into a, a holiday. He had said some negative hostile things about Dr. King, but it was our the persistence led by John Conyers. Music is even one of the culture's spirit, and then that's a national worldwide. And to quote the song, we know the key to unify all people is in the dream that you had so long ago. What's your dream? Well, I really dream we will learn to live together as brothers and sisters, not that our part is fools. We will look at the rules of, this, of that which is successful. When you look at these huge athletic events and budgets. Now, almost all of them have on the field multiracial, multicultural settings. It means that it really is true that, that if, 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 if we fight to even the playing field uh, and have fair rules and clear goals and transparent, we can make it. We must believe that there are no more foreigners we're all children of God, we all matter. And what's, um, and some of the simplest doing other things you have to do under you. Um, um, and, and prosperity is not zero sum game. Uh, when you ball up your fish, you can't grow and nothing can get in. The big issue in the record is about walls. Genesis here that we're close. If you plant two seeds in the ground of equal strength, you water them both. Put a wall between them. One will grow tall with multiples of fruit. One will be stunted. The taller is not better. The smaller is not lesser. The one that got sunshine, solo synthesis, made the flower grow. Not the seed, it was, it was, it was opportunity. And, and in some sense, the other side of it, if you walk between the two of us, on one side, you don't know, you don't know, you, you know, they're Swedish, or they're French, or they're German, or they're American. On the other side of the wall is ignorance and fear and hatred and violence. You don't know, you're ignorant of who's back there. You fear, you hate, you become violent. And that's true on both sides. When the walls come down, we're less ignorant, less hateful. Well, that's my life. I wonder, I used to wonder why the walls came down so slowly. Those who control the wall control the people. People are torn apart by, by a few people who want to control us. People need people. Today, too few people have too much. Too many don't have enough. And we must, we must tear down walls and build bridges. You can't honor Reagan for heaven bring the wall down in Berlin and build a wall between us and Mexico. Mexico is our eternal neighbor. Uh, and when Reagan said, when Trump says that they're bringing in drugs and alcohol, they're bringing drugs, and drugs into the country. The drugs are coming to the airport, seaport, and carports. Because we are, America is the most, uh, uh, we 
consume the most drugs, we buy the most drugs. Demand is driving drugs to America, not supply. Demand. We demand them. And we must put a wall around our appetites. And put, zippers on, and put zippers on our money. We must learn to love. Loving matters. Hope matters. Repeat, do this for me. Say, say I am. I am. Like, like, on your feet. Say, say, like the minute. Say, say I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. Respect me. Respect me. Oh, come on out. Say, I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. Red and yellow. Red and yellow. Brown, black, and white. Brown, black, and white. No pressures. No pressures. In God's sight. In God's sight. Everybody. Everybody. Somebody. Somebody. Stop the violence. Somebody. Save the children. Save Love the refugees. Everybody. 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 Somebody. 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 In my mind. In my mind. Can't conceive it. In my heart, I can't believe it. I know I can achieve it. I am somebody. Down with dope, up with hope. Down with dope, up with hope. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Use nonviolence. Use nonviolence. Long live Martin Luther King. Long live.
If you want to go to see the Martin Luther King exhibition at the Nobel Museum, you bring a friend and you get go to and you pay for one. And if you like the program tonight, please go and visit our website and you look at Facebook so you don't miss out on any future events. And once again, thank you so much, all of you, for coming tonight. And now I have the great privilege to once again welcome the fantastic Lorraine up on stage, who will end this evening with some more lovely music. Thank you so much and good night.